My name is Steve Phelps, and on behalf of Students for Origins Research and the Committee on Lectures, I'd like to welcome you to tonight's lecture. Um, I'd like to first of all introduce George Hillstad, who's president and general manager of the publishing company that handles the American books that are published here uh, for Dr. A. E. Wilder Smith. So at this time, I'd like to present George Hillstad. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be here this evening in Iowa. And I have that straight. We were came over from Chicago this morning. We'll be at the University of Missouri tomorrow, the University of Texas in Houston the next day, and the University of out in California the following day. And then we go on from there. We've enjoyed a very good tour thus far, and this has been our pleasure to bring Dr. and Mrs. Wilder Smith from Switzerland for uh, these for this month. It's about 30 days. We're covering 20 universities and colleges across the country and a number of other speaking engagements in television and, and radio um, interviews. We have published four of Dr. Wilder Smith's books uh, since um, during the last year actually and uh, trans had them translated from German. Uh, he has a number of books and we intend to have probably, if we can, probably four more uh, during this next year, uh, at least of his, of his books. The books that we have here um, available tonight, they're in the, in the lobby outside the hall, are um, Man's Origin, Man's Destiny, the subject of the last lecture this evening, uh, there's one that was just came off the press, The Natural Sciences Know Nothing of Evolution, The Creation of Life, A Cybernetic Approach, and then a question that someone, almost everyone asks sometime in their life, why does God allow it? All the problems and wars and troubles and God, how come all these things happen? And Dr. Wilder Smith has written this small book to give an answer to those questions. There are these four books by doc, Dr. Wilder Smith uh, can be obtained uh, as a package, four of them for $20, or they can be purchased individually. We have another book with us uh, by Dr. Gish, Dr. Dwayne Gish, that I think has been on your campus before. He's a biochemist, and at our request, he wrote a book. He and, and Dr. Clifford Wilson wrote a book on genetic engineering entitled Manipulating Life, Where Does It Stop? And that subject is, is um, cloning, test tube babies, abortion, surrogate motherhood, and things of that in that area. Happy to have Mrs. Wilder Smith with us, and I'm going to ask her to stand. I saw her a minute ago. Yes. <laughs> On a trip of this nature, I'm sure that you can realize that time is our biggest problem. And flying each morning and lecturing in the afternoon and evening, it is difficult to uh, get everything done and still uh, keep the professor alive. And uh, <coughs> he does the work and I, as he's, I think he suggests, I snap the whip. <laughs> but um, he's holding up so far and I am hoping he'll in the trip with us. He leaves for Switzerland on the 2nd of, of April. I fly back from Boston after a session at, the, at MIT on the 1st of April, the evening of the 1st of April, and then uh, leaving for Europe on the 2nd of April. I would hate to have to step into his, uh, into his lecture shoes any night, I can assure you of that. And so you can see why I'm pretty concerned. We will possibly have time for some questions after the, the lecture is over. Uh, the difficulty with questions is um, just throwing the, the audience over, open, it's almost impossible. We were at one place and we did this and uh, a young fellow stood up and asked his question, or started to ask his question, and 20 minutes later he had forgotten what the question was and we didn't know, and he had had a chance to use a nice big audience, there's about 2,000 in the audience, uh, to speak to, and he felt very good, I'm sure, 
to have an audience of that type to air his views, but uh, no one knew what the question was. And so to expedite things, what we've done is to uh, ask you if you'll write them out, and after Dr. Wilder Smith has given his lecture, uh, we'll give an opportunity for those that want to go, they can go, and some gentlemen will pick up the questions and we'll uh, take them from there one at a time. This way we can cover a number, many more subjects, obviously. And I think it'd be much more fair that way if we do it in that manner. <coughs> We've had the opportunity of lecturing to about uh, 12,000. I estimated possibly at uh, two-thirds of them, maybe more, three-fourths uh, students, university students, college students, during the past how long have we been gone? I think it's two weeks. I think we started the 23rd, if that's two weeks of February, something like that. And um, plus um, 10 colleges and universities, there's been uh, a number of other lectures. I think in all, possibly about 35 lectures uh, during this past two weeks. It's our pleasure as a publisher to arrange for the tour, and I'm sure that you'll enjoy hearing our guest speaker this evening. Dr. E. Wilder Smith studied natural sciences at Oxford University and received his first doctorate in organic chemistry. Some of you that may know the writings of C.S. Lewis, he was one of his professors at Oxford. And you'll recognize that in a book that we're publishing now that'll be out in a few, in a fortnight as he states. During World War II, he did cancer research at the University of London and was granted a, was made a fellow of the Royal Institute of Chemistry. Later, he became director of research at a pharmaceutical firm in Switzerland and taught chemotherapy and pharmacology at the University of, Sw of Geneva. Here, he received his second doctorate in pharmacology. Shortly after, he earned an additional doctorate from ETH in Zurich, which is equivalent to the MIT here in our country. From 1964 to 1969, he taught pharmacology at the University of Illinois Medical Center in Chicago. He also has also been a professor at the University of Bergen in Norway and a professor at Ankara, Turkey. Later, he became consultant to drug for uh, consultant on drug abuse for the NATO forces in Europe. And he has authored more than 50 scientific publications and approximately 20 books. Presently, he lectures at universities all over Europe and is a consultant for the University of Geneva and Zurich. He ma is married, has four children, all of whom are at medical college, two at Heidelberg, Germany, and two in England. And one of them has since received his, his um, medical degree and is interning in a college or in a hospital in England. With that, I present to you Dr. A. E. Weiler Smith of Einigen, Switzerland. Dr. Weiler. Evening, ladies and gentlemen. The uh, subject for this evening is man's origin, man's destiny. Now, I didn't know that I was going to speak on this subject. The the two are too much, you know, uh, especially as man's destiny will involve, obviously, some metaphysics. And I don't want to talk about metaphysics. I want to stick strictly to science. Now, if you'll understand that, that I'm not going to forget man's destiny, but uh, maybe I'll come back and talk to, that, talk to you about that later sometime. But... Uh, Man's origin, I will try to do from a scientific point of view. Now, there are two main views on the origin of all biology and the origin of ourselves. And Darwin tried to uh, integrate those two views, and he certainly tried to integrate us, that is, Homo sapiens, sapiens, with the origin, the general origin of uh, biology, and to separate us from the idea of a special creation. He didn't like that, and evolutionists today still don't like it. Um, now, what I'm going to say then about evolution in the first place will cover man 
in the views of Darwin, and that's what I want to do. I want to look at the seven hypotheses on which Darwinism, neo-Darwinism, is based. And then we're going to examine them from a purely scientific point of view and see how scientific they are. And then we're going to have a quick look at uh, creationism and see how, scien how uh, scientific that is. And then I want to go into the problem of time in generation of the genetic code. Because obviously, if you're going to have life, you must have the chromosomes and the genetic code together with the information which the genetic code stores and for which we retrieve our information, you must explain that too. So I'm going to try and do that on a chemical basis, show you the difficulties, and also show you an answer which science has itself given to show that creationism is certainly scientific, whereas the evolutionary explanation is less than that. Now, I want to do that in a gentlemanly manner as well as in a scientific manner. I don't think that by recriminations and shouting at one another and throwing mud at one another that you'll ever get anywhere at all. So I do believe that it's a good thing at all stages in the development of any science to sit down and take a look at the total situation from a new point of view and reconsider. I'm going to ask you, ladies and gentlemen, then, this evening, just to do a bit of reconsideration. You must remember that all sciences, with the exception of biology, have done some very, very fundamental reconsideration in the last years. Physics, as I learned it at university and school, is just not recognizable. It's been so changed from bottom to top uh, other sciences are in the same position. Chemistry, with all its MNRs and all those sorts of things, is thoroughly changed. The only one that's stuck is the neo-Darwinism of biology. And I'm of the personal opinion that we're right on the brink of a breakthrough in biology which will annihilate the neo-Darwinian view that most of us, or a lot of us, were brought up in. I was brought up in it, and I sat at the feet of Sir Gavin, Professor Sir Gavin de Beer at Oxford all my time there, and he is one of the foremost evolutionists even today. So I think I can say, with all honesty and humility, that I do know uh, the subject because I looked at it from the spectacles and was examined by Sir Gavin de Beer, the grand old man of um, biology today. Now look, let's get a kick off. The Dar neo-Darwinian theory rests upon the following seven hypotheses. And if you have a pencil, just take a look at and note these hypotheses as I go through them, because they'll help to clear your mind. They were worked out by G.A. Kirkert, who is Professor of Physiology and Biochemistry at the University of Southampton and who was educated in Cambridge. The first hypothesis is simply this, that non-living matter, which we call inorganic matter, although it's really chemically organic matter. By inorganic matter, I mean according to the seventh collegiate Webster Dictionary, I would never dare quote you, ladies and gentlemen, here, the Oxford Dictionary. I will quote you the Webster, which the uh, University of Illinois gave me as a parting gift when I went as AID professor to Ankara in Turkey. I still have it, and I still consult it. Now, this uh, use of the word inorganic, then, in my eyes, means that which is not alive. It may be, in the chemical sense of the term, uh, organic chemistry, but I mean that which doesn't live when I'm talking tonight, the non-living stuff. So don't please try and catch me on that. So many people do. Uh, it's not important. 
Now it says, the first hypothesis, hypothesis number one, that non-living matter gave rise to living matter spontaneously. That is that spontaneous generation did occur in the past. Now, as you know, spontaneous generation has never been observed. We've had some steps, as some people think, towards spontaneous generation. The experiments of Fox and Miller and Urey, people like that in Chicago some years ago, uh, producing alanine, a building block of life, from methane, ammonia, and water by passing an electric current through it, does produce, those experiments did produce a building block of life which they call alanine. And therefore, they said the first step has been produced. But the alanine that was produced, and indeed all amino acids that are produced by that method, are unfit for life because they're racemic. They have an equal quantity and must have an equal quantity. There's no argument about this point of the left-handed and the right-handed optical isomers. And biology uses only 100% left-handed isomers in the building up of the proteins of life. If there's any mixing, left-handed with right-handed, even one right-handed molecule in a chain 10,000 long. And the acceptor-receptor systems in biology will not work. And therefore, the, even the uh, evolutionists say that the idea of racemic life, such as stochastic chemistry produces, is unconceivable, inconceivable. Even Eigen, Manfred Eigen, is that. So if you're going to get spontaneous generation from inorganic molecules, the first thing you've got to do is resolve them. That is, optically resolve them. And separate out the isomers you need. Because the neurons, the proteins which are in the neurons and the rest of the body, all consist of amino acids which are optically resolved. Now, if you have the building block, a left-hand alanine molecule, and you couple it to a left hand, and you couple it to a left hand through thumb and little finger, you have a rough picture of what a living protein is. It consists of a long, 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 long row, and long, long rows of varying lengths of proteins made of left-handed amino acids. And these amino acids are like my left hand. They fit into left-handed gloves on the acceptor receptor systems which are necessary for the metabolism of life. Now, if you have a row, a thousand long or ten thousand long of left hands, and a row, a thousand or ten thousand long of left-handed gloves, and they all fit into one, one another, like a motorbike piston fits in a cylinder and goes in and out, the thing works perfectly, absolutely fine. But if you put in just one left-handed molecule, between one left-handed molecule and the next left-handed molecule, one right-handed molecule, the fit is destroyed, the alignment, the stereochemistry is destroyed, and you cannot, you cannot get the metabolism to take place and racemic or mixed left-handed and right-handed gloves and hands, these molecules are absolutely inconceivably capable of life. Now, you may say, oh, yes, it's just consistent that you've got more left-handed than you do right on chemical basis. It isn't because the entropy status of a left-handed molecule with one asymmetric center in it. Did you listen to me? With one asymmetric center in it. The entropy status is exactly the same as the right-handed molecule with one asymmetric center in it. So you can't do it. Now, they had a symposium on this subject recently, a year or two ago, in Jülich in Germany on the generation of the left-handed molecule 
and the right-handed molecule uh, with a view to multiplying and amplifying the asymmetry. Because everybody who knows his stuff knows that the building blocks of life have got to be optically pure. Now, stochastic chemistry is not capable, I'm stating something dogmatically here, I did my organic chemistry homework, I trust and pray, uh, very, very thoroughly. Uh, and I did a PhD on the subject. There's no way of doing it because the entropy status of the two is, is identical. Now, you can, in the lab, separate the two. I've done it kilogram-wise by adding another asymmetric center and thereby producing LL and LD, which are different and will crystallize differently, and you can separate them. Well, where are you going to get your asymmetric center to add to it if you can't start one? That's the problem. The only way to do it is Pasteur did it. Pasteur put the molecules under the microscope of mesotartaric acid and racemic tartaric acid, and then picked them out with pattern recognition. He looked at them with his eyes, and then had forceps in the hands and separated the two. Well, if you could see under the microscope a left-handed, and a right-handed molecule, then you could do it. But of course, a bit small to see, and a bit fiddly to pick up with a pair of forceps. But you could do it. You could uh, do it. Uh, you could do it quite nicely if you had some pattern recognition. But pattern recognition of this type is coupled to intelligence, and coupled to executive intelligence. That is the intelligence that recognizes the difference between the two molecules and then picks them out. Now, if stochastic chemistry is going to do that, then, uh, as the Englishmen say, then I'm a Dutchman, because you, uh, <laughs> you can't do it. Where are you going to do it? Well, if you're going to get spontaneous generation, you must. So come on, boys, let's do it. If you want a Nobel Prize, quick, I'll give you your problem, and I'll direct your thesis, but I'll tell you that since the entropy status of the two is identical, the left and the right, you won't do it by chemical means, unless you can get another asymmetric molecule to add to it. And just that you can't do. So you're stuck. You're stuck on the first hypothesis. You can't get spontaneous generation on that basis. Chemistry can't do it. Every chemist who's an organic chemist worthy stuff and has worked with organic chemistry, you wait until you work in one molecule with six asymmetric centers and have to generate each one. I had to do that, and that's real hard work. But you can only do it by adding another asymmetric molecule, which you can't get, unless you get it from a plant and take strychnine or brucine. The plant is programmed by asymmetric enzymes and by the genes in it, which are right-handed, which you can't get by stochastic chemistry, to do it. But if you can get round that and get the program to do it, but then they tell me the program will have started spontaneously to do it. Well, if you tell me that you can produce any program by chance, then I'm again, uh, I've changed my nationality again and I've become a Dutchman. I can't do it myself and uh, I find great difficulty in putting a bit of science into a simple thing like that. So spontaneous generation has never been observed to occur. And if it hasn't been observed to occur, and you can't repeat it, it's not scientific. That's all. Now that's the first postulate, which, of course, Kirkert points out, although Kirkert is an evolutionist, and which Sir Karl Popper also points out and says that these things are not possible by chemical means. They're not verifiable, and they're not repeatable, and they're not falsifiable. Therefore, he says the theory is not scientific, and he is an evolutionist. He says the theory, are you listening to me? Are you awake still? He said, I want to know, because I'm not going to waste my breath on the desert air, you know. That wouldn't, uh, that wouldn't do at all. Not after having spent so much breath on partly desert airs, which I will not uh, further uh, elaborate upon. Uh, uh, Popper says that since you can't repeat 
It's unscientific to do so. So he calls it, think how kind he was. He's an evolutionist. He calls it a successful metaphysical research program. Everybody's very kind on him about that because he's proved right up to the hilt. This is not repeatable, therefore not scientific. But he wasn't thrown overboard because he says, I've got nothing else. Now, that's the point, isn't it? What have you got to replace it? Well, that's point one. Now, point two says that spontaneous generation took place only once. Spontaneous generation took place only once. Now, the reason for saying that is very good. I learnt it with Sir Professor Sir Gavin de Beer. It's fine. He says this, and he said this, that because the, because the genetic code is pretty well identical in principle from all biology, from the virus upwards to Homo sapiens sapiens, then it's not likely to have been formed more than once by chance. After all, it's very unlikely that you get a language and a code which is loaded with information to form by chance at all. But if he says the code was formed a thousand times over at various times in geological history and always turned out the same code, he says that's exceedingly unlikely. And indeed it is. I'm with him there. And therefore he says that because the code is the same throughout all life, therefore it only occurred once by chance. Because if it occurred several times by chance, you wouldn't have got the same code out. The chances are practically nil to, to do that. So he says, well, as it only is the same in all, or nearly the same in all, it's only happened once, which I think is perfectly reasonable, don't you? I think it's perfectly sound reasoning to say that. But the only thing is, what you've done at the same time you are undone, as Shakespeare would have said, by uh, a thesis like that. Because if it only happened once, are you with me? If it only happened once, then it's not scientific. Because science deals with repeatable experiments. I did a wonderful experiment once with my professor in optical activity, and I got out a lot of optical activity where I shouldn't. And he said to me, Wilder, don't believe it. So I said, well, you must look through the polarimeter. So he looked through the polarimeter. Yes, he said, but did you leave perhaps any of the brucine in there that might account for that? Repeat it. And you know, I tried and sweated a week long to repeat it, and I couldn't. He said, forget it. It isn't scientific. It's a mistake if you can't repeat it. So I did, and he was right, of course. So if you can't repeat it, and you say that in the second hypothesis, on which evolution is built, you automatically make it metaphysical. Now, you see there, that's a double-edged double -edged sword. The creationists, I want to be just, ladies and gentlemen, the creationists say the creation took place once. Therefore, it's metaphysical. Okay, I'll accept that, although I'll give you some more reasons later for modifying that. But if creation, because you can't repeat it, is metaphysical, so is evolution. What are you shouting at us about? Isn't it? Aren't you with me? Don't you think that's right? Isn't it reasonable? If you say the one is not repeatable and that's the basis for our theory, then throw out the others. Your, your, your theory is not repeatable. Well, people who live in glass houses shouldn't throw stones, in my opinion. <laughs> A very dangerous thing, very dangerous thing to do. Now, Let's leave the second one, and we'll go on to the third one. Uh, it runs quite simply, the third one, that the viruses and the bacteria and the plants and the animals all are genetic, genetically derived from one another ancestrally. Now, there's no experimental evidence for the change of one species, and I mean this in a wide sense of the term, into another. I mean this, that you can't change experimentally an amphibian 
into a reptile. And it's very, very difficult, as far as I can see, experimentally as well as, th well as theoretically, to change, say, a reptile into a bird, or a reptile into a mammal, or a mammal into a primate, or a primate into the super primate man. Now, the reason, ladies and gentlemen, that I'm going to give you that is quite simple. The total genetic code of, say, a man is like a videotape or like an audio tape. And the information on that videotape is stored in a simulated form, a simulated form, in order to retain, store information which you can retrieve. You store things on a tape in magnetic fields, and then you retrieve them by passing them uh, over a, a head. Now, if you take two tapes, you can compare them to two species. You can compare, compare the genetic code of the frog, say, with the genetic code of a crocodile. Okay? Uh, you can line those up with, say, the tape, the audio tape of, say, Mozart. Now, I'm not saying Mozart's the frog or anything like that, but you can line him up from a purely experimental point of view uh, with the tape for Mozart. Nice piece of music we see from Mozart. I'm very fond of him. Um, or you can compare then the crocodile uh, with the tape, uh, say, a Beethoven. Now, I don't really mean to say that Beethoven uh, was like that, but I'm just doing this from information storage and retrieval. Okay? Because some of you aren't in engineers in, in uh, information theory, and I just try to make it plain like that, but don't grumble at me for doing it. Some people bl blame me for making things clear, you know, and uh, I, don't like, uh, I don't like to be put in that category. Well, now, look. You've got then the frog come Mozart, and you've got the Beethoven uh, uh, come...